in this lecture we will continue to see the constructive trusts before we go go to the subject today's subject matter we will revise what we have done in the last lectures first of all we define the constructive trust section 82 of the trust trusts ordinance provides that an obligation in the nature of a trust is created in the following circumstances or cases therefore there are some circumstances given from 83 to 98 from which we can identify the constructive trust as we have seen a constructive trust is not which is not created constructive trust is one which is not created by express or implied act of the settler but which is deemed that's very important which is deemed by operation of law or arises by construction of law once again a constructive trust is one which is not created by express or implied act of the settler law but which is deemed by operation of law or arises by construction of law in other way we can say where a person who is a legal owner of the property but is in fiduciary position as regards another person in respect of that property he is compelled by the doctrine of equity to hold the property for the benefit of that other person it is constructive trust but we have seen as we have seen in section 82 there are circumstances given in the trust ordinance itself that's why our constructive trust restricted and limited to the trust trust ordinance not anything outside that's why even though for the purpose of english law the definition what we have done what we have studied now may be applicable but for the purpose of sri lanka for the purpose of identifying the constructive trust in sri lanka simply we can say whatever circumstances given in the trust ordinance those are the circumstances not anything else then we have seen the section 86 sorry 83 of the trusts ordinance it provides that where the owner of the property transfers or bequeaths it and it cannot reasonably be inferred consistently with the attendant circumstances that he intended to dispose of the beneficial interest therein then the transferee or the legatee must hold the property for the benefit of owner or legal representative his legal representative now if we take an example we can understand very clearly already we have seen the illustration now we will see one example for the purpose of understanding section 83 a transfers his property to b but from the attendant circumstances but from the attendant circumstances he did not intend to dispose the beneficial interest to the transferee 
in that case the transferee must hold the property for the benefit of owner or his legal representative therefore a transfer the property to b but b agreed sometime b wanted to take a loan from the bank therefore a transfer the property to b to enable the b to get a loan from the bank once b settled the loan b must retransfer the property to a therefore the beneficial interest never ever transferred to transferee that means a transfer the property to b but not that beneficial interest once the property transferred to b b becomes legal owner of the property but still there is or there are some outstanding rights with the transferor therefore we must see in all these cases what are the attendant circumstances first thing we must see other one we must see whether there is any outstanding beneficial interest with the transferor that we must identify all these things from the attendant circumstances therefore the purpose of section 83 owner should that's a very important part here owner should transfer the property to another person but owner did not intend to intend to dispose of the beneficial interest to the transferee then the transferee must hold the property for the benefit of owner or transferor now in this context we have seen what is known as attendant circumstances attendant circumstances in the sense we have seen for example now a transfer the property to b but b did not pay the full amount of the or full value of the property sometime we we would have paid half of the amount or sometime some other debt or something then equal to that debt something like that then in that case actual issue is there is a consideration paid therefore payment of consideration must be sufficient if the payment of consideration is not sufficient then that is one of the attendant circumstances but that is not enough to prove the trust because only one and only fact is there that is insufficient consideration paid by b to a it doesn't mean that trust is arising in that context we have seen up to now we will see the powerpoint presentation or slide now some of the cases where there was held to be no trust either transferer remained in possession or the stated facts provided no indication as to who was in possession now the second thing first thing we have seen the consideration if the if there is no sufficient consideration it may be one of the attendant circumstances but only that fact is not enough to prove the trust that we have seen other one is possession when the when a transfer the property to b then he must give the possession also 
that's the normal deed of transfer. But in this case, even though A transfer the property to B, A continued to stay in the property. Because possession remained with the transferor. But that also we can say some extent we will say that is one of the attendant circumstances by which we can prove or establish that transferor did not intend to dispose the beneficial interest. Once again, very carefully note this one. Now the owner of the property, even though he has sold the property to B, he continued to be in the possession. A continued to be in the possession. That is one of the strong position there to prove the attendant circumstances by which we can show A did not intend to dispose of the beneficial interest to the transferee. Then another matter always discussed and in so many cases, an agreement to reconvey could come within the provisions of 96 of the trust's ordinance. Now the A transfer the property to B, then on the, day, on the day itself there may be an agreement, may be an agreement to re-transfer or reconvey the property back to A. Sometimes it may be written, it may be in written document or sometimes may be in oral understanding. Whatever it is, first of all we will see what is this section 96. We will move to other next slide here. This is section 96. In any case, not coming within the scope of any preceding provisions where there is no trust, but the person having possession of the property has not the whole beneficial interest therein. He must hold the property for the benefit of persons having such interest or the residue thereof to the extent necessary to satisfy their demands. Now, possession is one of the important factor to establish the intention of the other uh, uh, transferor, but still that is not enough. That's why here we say that in any case, not coming within the scope of any preceding provision, that means 83 to 95. Those are the main circumstances given in those sections. 83 to 95, those are the sections deal with circumstances. Then here we say that where there is no trust, then what we should do is, person having a possession of the property has not the whole beneficial interest therein, then he must hold the property for the benefit of person having such interest. Therefore, remaining in possession is not sufficient to prove the constructive trust. But it is one of the very strong evidence to establish the intention of the transfer. Because once the A, from the example that we have seen here, A transfer the property to B, but A continued to be in the position. That means A did not intend to dispose of any of the beneficial interest they are in. Right? Now we will see the next one. This is one of the main 
he is in section 83 i strongly recommend to read this case in full walim yachi versus abdul majid 45 nlr page number 169 in this case a sapphires were in embarrassed condition due to want of liquid cash and the creditors pressing for payment a transferred absolutely by means of notarial conveyance all his property to b who was one of the principal creditors the stated price being the amount of A's debts to B. Now what happened here? There were so many creditors. Then A all pressurizing for money payment. Then the money in the sense that's a liquid cash. But even though A has enough property to settle the claims, but he has no liquid cash to settle immediately. Then A transferred absolutely by means of notarial conveyance in the sense, A executed deed of transfer on his property to B because B was the one of the principal creditors. Then what is the price they stated? The stated price being the amount of A's debts to B. Then what happened? Value of the property was much more than the amount of A's debts. Now property may be 1 lakh. But the A is debt something say about 50,000 rupees, but the whole property transferred to A. A sought to prove by parole evidence that the transfer to B was effected to enable the B to manage A's affairs, collecting the rent and profits. If necessary, he can sell the property and after paying A's debts to pre-transfer the residuary properties to A. That's understand. That is the understanding because first of all, he, B was the principal creditor. Then the, the whole property transferred to B and A asked B, you take your money, that's my, that also there. In addition to that, you must collect all the rent and profits from these all property. And if necessary, you can sell the property. Finally, you settle everything and there must be balance. Then the balance property should be pre-transfer to A. A had been in possession of some other property, that's fine. Because now the property, even though the absolute transfer is there, reality is just to transfer the property to B to handle the or manage the A's affairs. A had been in possession of some of the properties. B was held to be a trustee for A of the residuary properties. B's argument was that there was no declaration of trust not only executed as required by section 2 of the prevention of frauds ordinance. Now as we have seen when we study the express trust we have seen Express trust must be executed in terms of section 5.1 and 5.2 of the trust's ordinance. Then the 5.1 we have seen that is in relation to the immoral property that should be executed 
notarially notarially executed then what is the meaning of notary executor it should be executed in terms of section 2 of the prevention of frauds ordinance now that's the point we b took here and b argued that there was no declaration of trust notarily executed in terms of that, that, that section 2 of the prevention of frauds ordinance at this stage we put forward the argument that according to section 91 read with 92 of the evidence ordinance evidence ordinance a written contract cannot be varied by oral evidence now the issue there are two matters here first thing is if a intended to create a trust he should have done in terms of say in terms of section 2 of the pfo the first argument and the second argument is there's a document in writing you can't bring or you can't con you can't contradict the document because you can't contradict the document which is which is in writing by oral evidence that's another argument now we will see what is section 91 of the evidence ordinance 91 section 91 of the evidence ordinance is under chapter 7 under the heading of the exclusion of oral by documentary evidence section 91 provides that when the terms of contract or of a grant or of any dispo any other disposition of property have been reduced by or by consent of the parties to the form of document and in all the cases in which all the matters is required by law to be reduced in the form of document that's fine no evidence shall be given in proof of terms of such contract grant or other disposition of property or of the matters except document itself or the secondary evidence of its contents in cases in which the secondary evidence is admissible under the provisions of herein before contained therefore simply we can say if there is a document which is in writing no evidence shall be given in proof of terms of that contract because everything is in writing you can't bring any evidence to prove that or contradict those things because that is in writing then then we will see section 92 of the evidence ordinance when the terms of any such contract grant or other disposition of property or any other matter required by law to be reduced to the form of a document have been proved according to the last section no no evidence of any oral agreement that's very important no evidence of any oral agreement or statement shall be admitted as between the parties to such instrument or their representatives in interest for the purpose of contradicting varying adding to or subtracting from its terms then i would like to say there are two provisos given to section 92 now when you summarize this section 92 if there's a document in writing that's a simple way there may be terms and conditions in the document whatever it is there's a document which is in writing no evidence 
of any oral agreement or oral agreement or statement shall be admitted as parties for the purpose of what we have for the purpose of contradicting varying or adding to subtract subtracting from its terms therefore if there is a document in writing there is a document in writing you can't submit any evidence to contradict the document which is in writing that's very important now what happened here how about cj rejected b's argument citing the proviso 1 to section 92 which is of the following effect as we have seen here any fact may be proved any fact may be proved which would invalidate any document or which would entitle any person to any degree or order relating there to such as fraud intimidation or illegality to summarize the situation where a person attempts to effectuate a fraud on another person alleging that other person had not adhered to the provisions of 51 in in respect of immovable property and therefore arguing that there is no valid trust other person can resort to section 53 to prove the constructive trust now what happened here now the property transferred to principal creditor there is residuary properties balance properties are there now it should be pre transfer anyway should be pre transferred as per the understanding oral agreement oral agreement but now we argues that if if the transferer a had some sort of intention to create the trust he should have executed a deed or document in terms of 51 he didn't do that therefore there is no intention to create the trust that was the argument but court said that now you say and argue now b argues because a did not create a trust under 51 there is no valid trust really what the b is doing here he is committing a fraud that's why if there is a fraud then what we should do is other person can resort in section 53 to prove the constructive trust in such instance other person can cite section 83 or 96 of the trust ordinance to prove the existence of constructive trust although the requirements of 51 and 2 or 51 or 52 have not been satisfied this is also one of the main case in relation to section 83 of the trust ordinance it is also highly or strongly recommended for reading benedict valangan burke versus hapwarachiki andoni 1991 slr page number 190 the plaintiff antony lived with the defendant appellant benedict and mother of four children as man and mistress plaintiff proceeded to sweden where he learned the language and received an income of about 9000 rupees the defendant went to sweden thereafter for short uh, spell and uh, she also found employment and receiving about 2000 rupees per month 
Plenty purchased a house in 1976 for rupees 840,000, paying consideration out of his earnings. In 1977, as he had to go again to Sweden, he conveyed the said house and house property to defend and appoint his mistress by deed of transfer in the attestation to which the consideration uh, of 40,000 was acknowledged to have been received earlier. The plaintiff sued here the defendant for return of house pleading a trust. Simply what happened here when you summarize these uh, facts of this case, both the uh, lived together, both are living together or something and thereafter the plaintiff went to the Sweden, went to Sweden and earned money and in between the lady also went to Sweden and earned money but the plaintiff purchased out of his earnings and thereafter he also again he decided to go to Sweden then he conveyed the property to defendant that's a mistress that is mistress. By deed of transfer, that means outside, uh, outright transfer or absolute transfer. In that one, they put the consideration as 40,000 and acknowledge and uh, also said that already received the money. Plaintiff suit now defendant for return of house pleading that they said this is a trust. Then what happened? Defendant claim absolute title and that he paid consideration of 40,000 rupees on the deed in her favor. Then court said that section 2 of the prevention of fraud's ordinance is not meant to govern trusts arising under chapter 9 of the trusts ordinance. I, I would like to add something here Generally, if the trust is created under Chapter 2 of the Trust's Ordinance, then the Section 2 of the Prevention of Fraud Ordinance is applicable. But here, Section 2 of the Prevention of Fraud's Ordinance is not meant to govern the trust arising, not creating, arising under Chapter 9 of the Trust's Ordinance that is constructive or implied trust. A person has, here, uh, has therefore to make out of the case falling within the provisions of sections 83 to 96 of the trust's ordinance. Second thing, the defendant court said that the defendant's claim was very probably false and her denial of existence of constructive case amounts to the fraud. Now she refuses, therefore it amounts to the fraud. Finally, court stated, Section 92 of the Evidence Ordinance does not apply and plaintiff can leave parole evidence of the existence of the constructive trust in his favor on the basis that he retained the beneficial interest in the property at the time he transferred it to the defendant. Then we will see this another case in relation to the attendant circumstances. Isenona and three others versus Premadasa, 1997, 1SLR, page number 169. It was said that seller paid the notary fee and stamp fees. Then the generally, 
if you are going if you are going to buy a land then you must pay the notary fee and you must pay the stamp duty not the seller that's the general concept but here what happened seller paid notary fee and stamp fees if it was an outright transfer the purchaser would have had to pay the charges why did the seller willing to come forward to pay same if the transaction was not beneficial to her in that she was receiving a loan or had received a loan for which a security was given in the form of outright transfer in fact according to the attestation clause most of the consideration have been received by the transferer prior to the signing of deed the fact that document was admitted by the plaintiff respondent that the purchaser the fact that seller paid stamp and notary charges the fact that deed was a document which came into existence in the course of series of transaction between plaintiff respondent and the fact that seller continued to possess the premises in suit just the way she did before the deed was executed all go to show that transaction was a loan transaction and not a not an outright transfer now these are the attendant circumstances now when you see this case how many attendant circumstances are there we can count now when you see here first place notary charges and stamp duty paid by seller first thing second thing deed was a document which came into existence in the course of series of transaction between the parties the second thing third thing seller continued to possess the premise third one then all together these are the attendant circumstances from which what is there what we are going to presume that the transferer seller did not intend to dispose of the beneficial interest to the transferee therefore this is trust trust is arising the attendant circumstances show that the seller did not intend to dispose of beneficial interest in the property transfer now we will see another case in relation to the attendant circumstances ehilia lebbe versus majid 48 nlr page number 357 it was held that if the transferer paid the whole, whole costs of conveyance it would be a test to find out the nature of the transaction the transferer paid the whole costs of the conveyance then it would be a test to find out the nature of the transaction it therefore appears that having taken the bulk of loan earlier first respondent appellant was forced to consent to the terms of the plaintiff respondent by allowing the cost, uh, cost of conveyance to be paid by the first respondent appellant plaintiff respondent exposed to the nature of transaction does it not show sure that first respondent appellant has not intended to take part with the beneficial interest in the land 
to the plaintiff respondent because the seller paid everything that means he is going to get some sort of beneficial interest therefore the first respondent the first defendant appellant had not intended to take part with the beneficial interest in the land to the plaintiff respondent therefore Ehilia Lepe versus Majid case in that case it was held that if the transferer continued to remain in the position after conveyance that would be uh, that would also be a test to find out the nature of the transaction now we will see another case here kulasuriya versus gunathilaka this is another interesting case here in this case this case relates to block of land which was conveyed by deed of transfer by kulasuriya to mohati for 10000 rupees the price that the premises in suit was later transferred to mohati by deed of transfer to kunatilaka for 40000 rupees then when you summarize these uh, facts kulasuriya transferred that property to mohati for 10000 rupees then mohati transferred the same thing to gunatilaka gunatilaka right then what happened? Gulasiriya took up a position that deed number 7948 was not in fact transfer but was executed in, for, in favor of Mohati as security for a loan and that he was holding the premises in suit on a constructive trust to, for, the, for Gulasuriya. And she, fur she further claimed that she had transferred the land to Gunatilaka dishonestly and fraudulently, fraudulently in order to place the property beyond his reach and disallow Gurkulasuriya to make the requisite payment and reconvey the property. Now the argument here now as we have seen in the exam in the, in the, in the case here when you summarize this case Kulasuriya transferred to Mohati, Mohati transferred to Gunatila. Now Gun Kulasuriya argues that he has transferred this property to Mohoti for a as a security for a loan. In addition to that, Kulasuriya's argument was that Mohoti transferred to Gunatilaka dishonestly and committing a fraud. Why? In order to place the property beyond her reach and disallow, the, disallow Kulasuriya to make the requisite payments and reconvey the property. The particular deed was an absolute transfer on the face of it. That's a deed of transfer, outright transfer and made no mention regarding the conditional arrangement or agreement to pre-transfer the property. But total market value of the property ranges between 11,000 to 15,000. And here the price is given Mohati Kulasuriya transfer to Mohati for 10,000 rupees. Then more or less there is no big disparity between the prices, between the 
actual price and the market price, market value. The court held that in the absence of any notarial instrument to establish the agreement to reconvey or even a not non-notarial agreement that could have been taken to account as attendant circumstance along with the fact that adequate consideration has passed, there is inconclusive proof of continued possession makes it impossible for this court to accept existence of such an argument to reconvey through which the constructive trust could be established. Therefore, it is clear that constructive trust cannot arise in the present case. Now, the possession first place failed. Consideration more or less sufficient consideration failed. In that case, how can we argue that the property transferred for a for a security for a loan? That's why in this case the argument failed and constructive trust cannot arise. Now this is another case, Fernando versus Damil. 47 NLR 297. Plenty conveyed a land to the defendant for sum of 650 rupees. Defendant agreed to settle the mortgage bond. On the same day, defendant gave plaintiff an informal document by which he undertook to give retransfer of the land within the period of three years on the payment of certain sum. The evidence of the second plaintiff expressed that no money was paid by the defendant on the day of transfer. That's one thing. And that she merely undertook to free, free the property from mortgage. Second thing. Third attended circumstance. She was reluctant to grant transfer and only did so on the agreement, on an agreement to retransfer. Fourth matter. Are circumstances indicative of trust? Then in the evidence when you put it in the order, no money was paid one thing on the day of transfer then she undertook to free the property from mortgage second thing she was reluctant to grant grant transfer only she did so on the on an agreement to dreams three transfer it's the third one all these circumstances known as attendant circumstances these circumstances are indicative of a trust in this case there are circumstances tending, tending to show that transfer was to be in trust. Moreover, moreover there is a gross disparity in the price. This is the fourth one. As mentioned in the deed, the value of the property was 650 rupees, but real market value of the property was more or less 1750 or 2000 rupees. Then the disparity, the gross disparity in the price of the property we must consider. The defendant admits that the agreement to retransfer the property, defendant admits the agreement to retransfer property and also that he had no money at the time of transfer. This is the fourth, fifth evidence. Circumstances, attended circumstances. And he also says that when he gave the execution of deed, he had no intention of retransferring the land, but he would he would do so now if he was paid. That means there was an agreement, he agreed to do that, everything is perfectly done. Therefore, he, this is really a trust. 
Anyway, it was proved that no money was paid by the defendant. One, plaintiff was reluctant to grant retransfer, only did on, on an on, only did on an agreement to retransfer. Second one, there was a gross disparity in the price between the price and the value of the property, and it was held that transfer of the land was to be in trust and establishing fraud on the part of defendant. The district judge held that being an informal document subsequently made cannot be used to vary which is in which is an outright transfer. He however admitted informal document to prove that the defendant held the property in trust for plaintiff, not to contradict the document. The court held that informal document was admissible to prove that defendant held the property in trust for plaintiff and further that informal document was not as admissible under the proviso 3 of section 92 of the evidence ordinance. Then here we don't contradict the terms and condition of the document which is in writing, what we are doing here, we are establishing, we are proving the existence of trust. Now we will see this is also one of the important case, Dayavadi and others versus Gunasagara and others, another. 1991 1 SLR 150. Plaintiff building contractor needed finance in 1966 and sought assistance from second defendant with whom he had transactions earlier. This culminated in a deed of transfer in favor of the first defendant who is the mother of second defendant and the second defendant being a witness to the deed. Uh, two, just a two friends, they, they have some old, old transaction for them earlier. Now he, one person was in difficulties, he asked the money from this, his friend, then he asked from his mother, that's the way they arranged, culminated the deed of transfer in favor of first defendant who was the mother of second defendant. Property was to be retransferred within three years if rupees 17,000 was paid. Plaintiff defaulted in his action to recover the property. Plaintiff succeeded in the trial court in establishing constructive trust. The court of appeal reversed the judgment on the sole ground that agreement was a pure and simple agreement to pre-transfer. The Supreme Court held that, as was emphasized by John B. B. On B. Mount in William Achi vs. Abdul Majid, one has to bear in mind that the trust's ordinance is a later enactment and it deals expressly with trusts. Naturally, in any conflict of provisions of evidence ordinance with the provisions of trust ordinance, the later must undoubtedly prevail. I think the best of these all guides on this question is the observation given by H.N.C. Fernando in Muttama versus Thiyagaraja. He stated in that case as follows. The plaintiff sought to prove moral promises to reconvey not in order to enforce that promise but only to establish an attended circumstance. That's a very important point. Plaintiff sought to prove oral premises to reconvey, 
not in order to enforce the promises but only to establish an attendant circumstances from which it could be inferred that the beneficiary interest did not pass. Although the promise, uh, promise was of no force while in law by reason of section 2 of the prevention of frauds ordinance, it is nevertheless a fact from which an inference of the nature contemplated in section 8D of the trust ordinance properly arises. Then the ultimate purpose of producing oral promise, uh, promises here to prove or to establish an attended circumstances from which it could be inferred that the beneficial interest did not pass. That means beneficial interest is with the transferer. Then the transfer must hold the property for the benefit of transferer. The prevention of frauds ordinance does not prohibit the proof of such an act. If the arguments of counsel for the appellant based on the prevention of roads ordinance and on section 92 of the evidence ordinance are to be accepted, then it will be found that not only section 83 but also many other sections in chapter 9 of the trust ordinance will be nugatory. And that's useless because if you accept those things, section 2 of the prevention of fraud ordinance and section 92 of the evidence ordinance, then there won't be any trust at all under, say, under chapter 9. The court held that prevention, that's very important, court held that prevention of fraud ordinance and section 92 of the evidence ordinance do not bar parole evidence to prove a constructive trust and that transferer did not intend to pass the beneficial interest in the property. That evidence to prove attendant, attendant circumstances had been properly received in evidence at the trial. Therefore, it is clearly said that this is a constructive trust. A constructive trust is arising out of these facts. Now, we will summarize what we have studied up to now. In the first lecture we have studied the definition for constructive trust and we have seen the section 83. And thereafter what we have studied in section 83, property transferred not the beneficial interest. A transfer property to B, the ownership vested to B, not the beneficial interest. For that purpose, we have to identify whether the beneficial interest is uh, transferred or not. That depends on attendant circumstances. For the purpose of identifying the attendant circumstances, we now we identified so many attendant circumstances. We have identified so many attendant circumstances. First one, price, consideration. Second, possession. Third, stamp duty and other duties paid. Fourth, we have seen continued to be in possession. That's the possession that we have seen. And reconvey agreement. The reconvey the agreement, finally we have seen, it may be in writing, may not be in writing. If it is in writing, 
then we can produce and we can say that is one of the attended circumstances. If it is not in writing, if it is just a mutual understanding, oral understanding, then the problem was there. It is in violation of section 2 of the PFO and section 92 of the evidence only. But the court clearly said finally PFO section 2 and section 92 of the evidence ordinance do not bar parole evidence to prove the constructive trust. As we have seen section 92 of the evidence ordinance, one cannot submit evidence to contradict the document which is in writing. But here, under section, in terms of section 83 of the trust's ordinance, we don't contradict the document, we accept the document, but we, uh, we, we give some sort of evidence, parole evidence, to prove or to establish the attended circumstances from which we can infer whether the beneficial interest has been passed or not. These are the things we have seen in this lecture. We will continue to, to, continue to see the section 83 some more cases uh, we must see now, continue to see in other next lecture also. We will stop with, uh, now we will stop with this lecture. Thank you.